Hello, my name is Victor Hess. I was born at the McClellan Hospital in Xenia, Ohio, and spent most of my first 36 years in Xenia. Now, a couple of those years we had moved to Dayton, and a couple years were spent in a little town called Sabina. And I graduated from Xenia High School in 1964, went to Central State College for a year, and then to Ohio University. And then I was lucky enough to join the U.S. Army. After that, I returned to Xenia and worked there before moving to Louisiana in 1979. And ever since my marriage in 1973, we have been involved with church, teaching Sunday school, Bible study, confirmation classes, and we sang in the choirs. And most of this was in Methodist churches. And I say all this now because like many writers, my personal history has impacted my writing. I started writing in 2014 at the age of 68 because I had a personal story I wanted to share with my close family. Since then, I've written short stories, two books, and now working on the third one in my tale about a young boy, his divorced mother, his abusive father, and his baby sister and their efforts to eke out a living and somehow find meaning in rural Ohio in the 1950s. Much of the events in the two books are based on historical fact and much of it is based on a little bit on my experience. We write what we know. But nevertheless, much research was necessary to stay true to the time. And so with that in mind, I want to discuss the story about this boy. Let's look at what some readers think of Jesse Hall, our protagonist. One of my reviews said, Fans of To Kill a Mockingbird will like this book. Well, I especially like this since I love that story and since my publisher is Brother Mockingbird. As the world surrounding Atticus Finch was visible through Scout's eyes, and I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. So in my book, we see Jesse's hopes shattered by a deadly disease and poor choices made by his mom. And we see all this through Jesse's 10 year old eyes. It is also through his eyes that we see a community actually move in his life. Another review said Jesse's world is Dickensian bleak, but his spirit is indomitable. Well, Charles Dickens was a master at describing conditions of the poor, and then he managed to rescue his hero with the help of others. In the Clock Tower Treasure, Jesse is faced with conditions of poverty and responsibility, but his spirit seems to rise above his dire conditions. Well, another reviewer said, A time when America was America. You know your neighbor and everyone looked out for one another. And true, Jesse was raised in the 1950s, a time of new homes, television, astronauts, new cars, and rock and roll. It was a time of nuclear threats and a time of deadly polio. Another reader said, Jesse has adult responsibilities. At 10, Jesse had a paper route. He earned extra money by redeeming soda bottles for money. He bought and paid for his own bike. He babysat his two-year-old sister and when necessary cooked meals while his mom worked full-time at a drugstore and then sewed to make extra money. Finally, another reader says, Jesse has a lot going for him. His own spunk and the support of friends, including, oddly, the friendship of a mummified old stranger. So let's go to that. The Clock Tower Treasure opens with Jesse having a one-sided discussion with the Sabina tourist attraction, Eugene, a mummified corpse on display for over two decades. I'll read from the first chapter. 
The Clock Tower Treasure, Chapter 1 Advice from a Dead Man Behind the Bigley Funeral Home was a small brick building that used to store tools until this guy was found dead at the edge of Sabine, Ohio. Well, they cleaned out the shed and laid the corpse out inside so people could come by to try and identify him. And that was 26 years ago, 1929, and he's still there. People from everywhere came to see Eugene and write their name in his visitor's book. Tonight, it was locked. So I pulled out my knife to jimmy the latch like my friend Karen showed me. I looked around through the mist to be sure no one could see me, and once in, I closed the door and flipped the light on. Both of my closest friends were girls. Lynn was almost 10 years old, like me, and lived downstairs from us. Karen was 19 and lived across the street. Karen told me she liked to visit Eugene when she had some problem to fix. Eugene was a temporary name they gave to that dead man. Even though he never spoke, she said just talking to him seemed to inspire the right answer in solving her problems. Although she was so cool, I never thought she had any problems. Eugene lay there in his small room, waiting, arms on stomach, and his gold tooth glistening from the bare light bulb. Hi, Eugene. It's Jesse, I offered. Karen, you know the clerk at Nisley's Five at Five and Dime? She said you helped her think through her problems. Can you help me? I stepped toward him. I have to move, and I'm not happy about it. We're moving in with my brothers and their dad. You know, Gary and Danny. They were here yesterday. I leaned my head against the chicken wire that separated Eugene from the people who came to see him. It was very quiet in the room. We've lived here a whole year, and now that I have friends and a paper route, Mom wants us to move. I backed away and put my hands in my pockets. I don't want to go. I like it here. I turned and glanced up at the wall covered with news clippings about Eugene. By the way, how did you end up in Sabina? You don't know anyone here, cause by now you'd have a real name and a headstone in the cemetery. Did someone drive you here and drop you off? Did you stay with someone here? What were you looking for? The article I was looking at had a photo of Eugene taken before they put up the chicken wire. My dad made a mess of it. He hurt mom and now we're split up. Did you make a mess of it? I stared at him. His eyes were closed like he was sleeping or praying. He was wearing a suit, white shirt and tie, ready for burial. Did you gamble? Did you get drunk? Is that what you did? That's what my dad did. How come you didn't have any identification? Did the guys that find you take your billfold? They said all they found was a piece of paper with an address. Look, it's right here in this article about you. I pointed at the framed article from the Wilmington paper. They said they found you lying in a ditch by the Cantrell farm. What happened? Were you sick? They said you died of a heart attack. Do you have kids? Because if you do, I wonder why they didn't look for you. I waited, staring at the sign on the wall describing Eugene's history. I'd read it a hundred times, and he was still a mystery. I tried to imagine him alive back in 1929, walking through Sabina. I wondered if he was wearing a suit when he was found. Did you have a wife? Did you guys fight a lot? I waited after each question, like, like he was really going to answer me. The pamphlet never said where he was from, only that a Cincinnati address was found in his pocket. Where did you sleep the night before you died? I asked him questions the pamphlet didn't answer. So I waited for a sign or something, anything, but nothing happened. 
You know, once you're identified, they're going to bury you. They say you're just, you're just good for business. Did you know that? More than a million people have visited you. Did you know that? I studied the visitor's book counting the different states people came from. My dad is supposed to pay his child support, but he's always late or skips a week. Mom says we won't have to worry about that in Xenia. She won't need his money anymore because Albert's going to take care of us. Albert is Gary and Danny's dad. She divorced him once. I wonder why she would even want to get back with him. Mom's been singing a lot since she told me about us moving. You should hear her sing. She's really good. Maybe you remember when she came here. She brought me the first time I met you. I guess I'm lucky. It's a new house. She said we have to move on. I was back clinging to the chicken wire. It's not fair. Everyone else who come to Big Lee's gets their own grave with their name on it. All you get is this shed and a borrowed name. Once you're identified, maybe then, I bet you'll have your family. Suddenly I heard the doorknob jostle. I reached over and flipped off the light and hid behind the table that held Eugene's visitor's book. The door opened. Jesse, are you in here? It's me, Karen. She flipped on the light. I stood up. How did you know I was here? I was glad it was her. It's the first place I'd look. There was a light under the door, she said. Your mom is worried sick. What are you doing here? She quietly closed the door. I have a big decision. I thought Eugene could help. I walked toward Eugene. Well, Eugene, did you help Jesse? She turned to Eugene with her hands on her hips. I edged closer to her. We both stared at him. I was waiting for him to nod or utter some wise words. She reached for my hand. I tingled at her touch. I always did. We're moving, but not till Christmas. I'll miss you, I said. We're going to miss you too, Jesse. Right, Eugene? Then she turned to me. I think we're the only ones who talk to him. I was still looking at Eugene's face, waiting for some sign, but he just lay there, still dead. Shh! She flipped off the light. We heard steps. They stopped, then continued down the street. Let's go, Jesse. Bye, Eugene. She smiled at him. Her face was beautiful. She opened the door slowly and peeked outside. Come on. We walked quietly for a few minutes. We could always ride each other, Jesse. Your mom told me about your new house. I bet Mr. Davis could get you a paper route in Xenia. You'd make a lot more money there. You need to ask him about that. It's a big city. Xenia's a lot bigger than Wilmington. You'd have some keen stories to tell your new friends. Like busting up the purse snatching kids. Mike Stafford still doesn't talk to me. Do you think he knows I'm the one who took that picture that got him caught? Does that bother you? A little. I wanted to see his dad's car showroom. I've never been in a showroom. You sure like your cars. I want to see the new Ford Thunderbird. Me too. That's one fine car, Jesse. She held my hand all the way home. She was like a big sister. And that ends that reading. So chapter one provides a unique way of looking at Jesse's current condition, and we even find out that he is hesitant to make another move. So what is next? Well, the third book of Jesse Hall's currently titled The Wesley Seven Club. It takes Jesse to his first year in college, and we'll see who Jesse has grown up to be. It will involve more research about selective service, the draft, JFK, Martin Luther King, and the space race. Thank you for listening to this session on Jesse Sings and the Clock Tower Treasure.